what you have to understand here is that we have uh, in 2024 an awful lot of problems uh, politically around the world. And that sort of uncertainty is what provides the underlying base for gold. And I mean, just look at, at, at New York City. It's an absolute disaster. You, you've got rats r- actually running around openly on the streets. Uh, it's Along with criminals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've cut the police spending down by $5.6 billion. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network. Now, more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to and watching the Financial Survival Network. And I'm Kerry Lutz, your host. It's December 8th. We've got one of your most favorite popular guests on, Martin Armstrong. We're going to change things a little bit. Of all the guests I have on, Marty, you by far receive the most questions. I try to ask them, but sometimes... I, I miss them and then people get upset with me. So I decided we're going to change it up a little bit. We're just going to do a Q&A from many of our listeners out there. And then I've got a couple for you. But we're going to start off with this one. And from my friend uh, from the land down under, please ask Mr. Armstrong to give his interpretation of what the U.S. debt clock is trying to convey. He has a picture attached. We're not going to bother with that. But it shows a dollar supply at a negative number but still diminishing and links it to the dollar silver gold ratio. What's going on in that situation? Thanks in advance. Uh, Well, I mean, the real value of gold, it goes up. Like, for example, um, gold had bottomed in 1976 at $100. It rose to about 400 by December uh, 79. But the last six weeks, it went from 400 to 875. Why? Because that's when Russia invaded Afghanistan. The real mover of gold is not inflation or you know this, this kind of propaganda all the time. It's when confidence in government collapses. That's what we're really facing at this point. Um, 2024 is going to be the year from political hell. It's not just the U.S. I mean, you look around, you've got elections everywhere. Russia, uh, the head of the EU is up, but you got British elections coming. Um, I mean, every it's like you're going to take whatever politics there is, put it in a jar, shake it, and you know, and and pour it out. It, it's just crazy everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And we're gonna. I got a question for you later about the Argentine election. Your next question is: China seems to be transmorgrifying or morgraphing into an Asian cacotopia, which I think means dystopia, if uh, my vocab serves me correct. Question, by 2032, is China going to look like a technocratic empire worse than an Orwellian big brother nightmare? Is truth going to end up more stranger and more dangerous than fiction? Uh, No, not really. Uh, What we're what our computer is showing, oh yeah, you shut that thing off. Um, what our our computers are actually showing is that for 2032, we're looking at all governments basically changing, and that that applies to China as well. Uh, so it's not that I mean a lot of the propaganda about China. Uh, I mean, I can tell you <clears throat> most of the actual problems there with the banking, et cetera. China warned uh, its provinces and the banks not to borrow in dollars. They were doing so because interest rates were cheap. And they said, do not do that. They did not act as an authoritarian. They probably should have Mm -hmm. and just think we outlawed it, but they didn't. So that's why you have banks failing, et cetera. Uh, But you know, the people in China are not about to go back to communism or anything like that. The same thing in Russia. They've all had enough of that stuff. Uh, and once you give them a taste of freedom, I mean, there's a lot of billionaires in both Russia and China. They're not communists anymore. 
um, I was talking to one, you know, congressman, and he goes, "Oh, you know, China's communist." I said, "Do you understand what communism even is? You know, the government owns everything." I said, "You know, it's a it's a question of saving face." You know, they still call it the Communist Party. Uh, it's not communism, but if they change the name of the party, then they'd have to take down the picture of Mao, you know, and admit that they're wrong. <laughs> and take so, them off the money, too, right? Yeah. As long as you want. <laughs> it would be a major psychological announcement that, sorry, for 50 some years we were wrong. <laughs> um, so it, it's just opened up. I mean, you. People can freely travel, and and you got private ownership and everything, and it's they just kept the name. That's it. Um, but you know, you're looking at uh, China's economy got into a lot of trouble mainly because they went very draconian with the whole COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, locking people down, and and when you do that, the the GDP collapses. People can't go to work. Uh, you have uh, uh, you know a portion of the class that that have lost their homes because they couldn't work and they couldn't make payments. Um, you know, so a lot of these politicians, not just in China but also throughout America and Europe, are beginning to realize what they did was serious. Uh, and then you warned about it. You and I warned about it too. Yeah, you know, look, it's you know the inflation we have here is. Because of shortages, it's not speculation. So raising interest rates is not going to make you know going to make it rain or anything else. It's uh, that's why the Fed's kind of like in a between a rock and a hard place. I mean, it can it sees the inflation, yes, and then you can manipulate the CPI down to pretend it's not there. But um, the reality is, is that you still go to stores. I mean, I just went to the store the other day, and there was stuff that wasn't there. Yeah, I see it. I see it. And what is there is uh, being shoplifted in places like uh, L.A. and San Francisco. You know, I went into a CVS in, uh, I was out in L.A., and everything was under lock and key. I wanted a bottle of eye drops. They were like 20 bucks. I had to wait 15 minutes for a salesperson to come. I went to the same CVS down the street from me in Florida. All the racks are open. You can get almost whatever you want. They're, they have locked up some high value items, I will say that. But I was able to get the same drops, pick them up myself, and no greater contrast than that. Uh, next question How far will gold fall in this cycle? Some are predicting a drop of 1450 to 1500 US before really taking off time frame. So I guess how far is it going to drop? Will it go to 1450, 1500? In what time frame? Uh, that's a bit extreme, but what we're really looking at is um, I'm hoping to see a pullback in gold uh, going into January. We're only talking basically a few weeks ahead. Um, if we get a low in January, then gold would be in a position to rise for most of the year. If you get a new high in January, then it's the opposite. But what you have to understand here is that we have, uh, in 2024, an awful lot of problems uh, politically around the world. And that sort of uncertainty is what provides the underlying base for gold. And I mean, just look at, at, at New York City. It's an absolute disaster. You, you've got rats actually running around openly on the streets. Uh, it's a lot they, of criminals. <laughs> yeah, I mean they've cut the police spending down by five point six billion dollars, and they go, oh well, we're going to tax uh, congestion and cars driving around to clean the air. Meanwhile, they cut the the budget for sanitation, so you get clean air but dirty streets. And there's no congestion anymore because nobody's working in the place. The buildings are more than half empty. I think a third are occupied now, and 20% uh, of the space is vacant, but uh, the rest of it is just on care and maintenance. All right, and this ties in with the next question. You answered the other question about precious metals, when they'll, f when they'll start moving. So we need to look for January, whether it makes a new high or low. If we carry the trend now, it looks like it could be hitting a low there. Uh, but... Um, Martin, you moved to Florida because your model said it would be the best state going forward. People are moving to Florida and Texas. 
but what five states did your model say will fare the best in the coming years? And he says, we need multiple state choices instead of simply reciting the states we are all moving to. Um, we're going to publish a report on that uh, and do a more detailed look because we get an awful lot of people that want to know. Um, Florida is still number one, I can tell you, mainly because um, Texas is getting inundated with all the illegal aliens moving across. Mm -hmm. And uh, even places like Austin and things like this that used to be really nice, you're starting to get, you know, rising crime and things of that nature. And I was just out in, in Austin. A lot of them said, gee, I think I'm going to move to Florida now. And <laughs> I said, well, Jake, well, go to the East Coast, please. You know, <laughs> I mean, the traffic's already doubled here. I mean, it's um, to get to Florida, they got to swim. Um, <laughs> yeah, I 10 is about the worst interstate highway on the planet. And that's what connects Texas and Florida eventually. Um, yeah, I've, and, and that's a follow up to that. To which five countries did your model say would fare the best going ahead? Uh, short term, basically, it's still uh, largely the United States. Um, what you have to understand is, I, I know a lot of people get all, you know, worked up over the debt and things of this nature, but we also have the largest economy. And the main issue is, is that we, our economy is a consumer-based economy. Compare it to Germany. Germany is a mercantile type. Uh, in other words, they manufacture things and want to sell it to somebody else. Um, it, the, you look at the net worth of, of the average German, it's less than an Italian because they keep their taxes very high, they're afraid of inflation, things of that nature. So they really suppress their own people. Uh, and that mercantile model is, is like from the 1800s, you know. Uh, uh, in contrast, China has looked at, at both models. And if you pay attention, you'll see China is trying to mimic the consumer base from the United States. They understand what made the United States the biggest economy in the world, and that was the whole issue. So China is trying to develop its own um, consumer-based economy, you know, this Silk Road, things of this nature. Uh, and uh, so uh, U.S. is still number one. Uh, Mexico is actually, you know, pretty, you know, it's been pretty interesting to a lot of people because they did not do the, uh, uh, the draconian COVID lockdown stuff. Uh, a lot of people went there uh, mainly because they didn't have to be vaccinated to go for a simple vacation. Uh, and so you have an awful lot of people also moving towards Mexico and, um, so I think, you know, you also, you know, you have others going down to like Uruguay um, uh, and you're, you're beginning to see like, you know, Argentina overthrowing the, the left. Um, you're seeing the same thing down in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a shift. Uh, I mean, you've had this leftist idea in South America for such a long time. And it's done nothing but suppress the people. Um, I mean, Argentina used to be one of the richest countries in the world. That's right. Most people don't realize that. Turn of the century. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, then in comes the, the communism stuff, the Marxist agenda, and they basically wiped out the economy. Uh, and people right. have never advanced since. Yeah, and the, only the buildings, the architecture is magnificent there in Buenos Aires, but uh, they're living off their capital from 100 years ago. So as long as you raised Argentina, I'd have a question for you. With uh, Millie's uh, avowal to eliminate the central bank, and I guess to dollarize the economy, um, is it going to work? And in this day and age, we uh, truly control monetary growth and uh, and actually make an economy grow. Um, no, I mean, uh, I just did a piece on that. Pegging to the dollar is not going to be a great idea. 
because what when you peg, it's different than a fixed exchange rate. Um, for example, under Bretton Woods, it was fixed exchange rate, but you didn't import influences from other countries. When you peg uh, a, a currency like to the dollar, if the dollar raises, you know, we raise interest rates, they're raised there as well. If, if we have inflation, it's immediately exported to them. Um, hostage. They're held hostage. Yeah, it, it's not the same thing. And a lot of these politicians, they don't really understand there, you know, there are three monetary systems, fixed rate, pegging, and a floating rate. Um, Milton Friedman's idea of a floating rate, which he first raised in 1953, was that it would be a check in balance <clears throat> against the politicians. Um, you know, I knew Milton, you know, personally. I mean, I... I think the problem with it is that the assumption that the, the politicians would actually ever be responsible and is is kind of uh, uh, not realistic. Uh, uh, I mean, this is why the Fed's in trouble. If the Fed raises interest rates, uh, back in the 30s, the, the U.S. government had a balanced budget. So the idea, okay, fine, we can raise interest rates to affect demand or lower them, and we were the demand. But now the government is the biggest borrower in the system. If the Fed raises interest rates to get us to stop spending so much, it has it only increases the spending of government. No politician goes down, oh, gee, the Fed raised interest rates so they want us to spend less. Let's cut the budget, and it will never happen. But... <laughs> Yeah, Eric, this is my own personal favorite question, and we got probably 50 or 60, but we can't go through all of them. Um, also, could you ask Martin if he has studied specifically the cycle of moral corruption as a as a social phenomenon? Are we anywhere near the top, or do we have room to grow to new heights? Here in Europe, it seems like they are empty to... Uh, it's not his first language. They emptied uh, the gates of hell. They opened the gates of hell, and no single evil has remained down. This is part of why uh, civilization collapses. Uh, at, at the end, you you get this complete corruption because you know government is keep trying to survive, and as a result, it just it. Uh, you know, it just, it just basically is like a cancer that eats them apart. I mean, take like what they did to Trump in New York. All right. Saying that, you know, oh, he, un he overvalued his assets. Oh, and, I a disclaimer. and he had a disclaimer. Don't rely on my numbers. It's a guesstimate. Yeah. But it, it, the, the point is, is that it, it's so absurd. You go to a bank the bank has its own appraisers. You yeah. can put down whatever you think it is. They're go the bank's going to say, well, we think it's only this. So uh, <laughs> what they're doing to Trump is saying, well, we think the value should have been this, even though you paid off the loan, doesn't matter. All right. Um, the problem is once you create that precedent, they can go down the line and start going after every company in New York City. Every company on the big board, everybody puts values down. Yeah, there's a cost basis, but then there's a, a a market basis, and the bank doesn't want to know what you paid for Trump Tower 30 years ago when they're going to collateralize it. They want to know what it's worth today. So okay. you're going to give them a number, and they're going to get an appraiser to come up with a number, or their uh, their MBAs will do a spreadsheet, and then you like haggle, and then you agree on a value, and that's that's the way these loans take place. So they valued it at less than half what he did. They still made the loan. So obviously they weren't relying on any purported false representation. I'm going back to my days as a lawyer. So, and there's no damage, but sometimes it doesn't matter if there's damage or not. If there's fraud, you don't want it in the system. But nonetheless, uh, specifically, they were not relying on this anyway. Uh, so the moral corruption cycle, uh, 
is there any limit to it? When does it crash? When society? Yeah, no, I mean, um, we're starting to get into the crash mode. Uh, you take this 2024 election we have here in the States. I don't care who wins. Either side, they're both going to say it's rigged. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're looking at a situation now where this um, this election in particular, it's just not going to be accepted by either side. doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> you had Hillary starting it back in 2016. Oh, Putin and... Putin did. I really won all this other kind of stuff. And then, you know, 2020 election. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this it's just building. You can see it. Yeah. So, I mean, for the United States, for the Biden administration to even allow these these lawsuits uh, against Trump, uh, it, it shows you something is significant. Normally, you charge somebody like that, their credibility goes down. Yeah. His is going up. He's forty-seven percent uh, higher than any other Republican on the field. Yeah. So that is kind of showing you the collapse in confidence in government itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you had Argentina, you know, say, "Oh, well, that's a good idea. We should criminally charge my opponent." Brazil tried the same thing with with Bar- you know, Bolsonaro. But I mean, you end up. In a situation, once you do that, well, there is no re- there's no going back. Uh, right. It's the same thing, you know. They were they <clears throat> had to go and impeach Trump. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Don't you realize you okay? You do that when it's your turn. They're going to come after you for the same thing. It, you know, it, so they're going after Biden. I mean, it, it to me, it's just an. Hey, I've worked on Capitol Hill. I can't imagine how stupid these people really are um <laughs> they really think what oh we'll, pe- we'll impeach trump they just look at that immediate election they don't look at what that means long term mm-hmm. uh you start doing this they're the other side's going to start doing it. it it's that's just that's washington yeah you know uh, mark twain said uh, truth is stranger than fiction uh Fiction is limited by the imagination, and truth isn't. And this That's is a true. classic example. Hey, so here, along those lines, uh, this is a good question too. History has proven that power corrupts from the fifth grade hall monitor to the Pope. As long as humans are in the equation, how will we ever find an equitable and fair system? Kim wrote that, and I would just point out that once upon a time, the uh, U.S. system was born from exactly uh, what they're saying there. And we had a relatively, I don't want to say, it wasn't perfect by any stretch, but it functioned. And it functioned for the benefit of most people, as long as you weren't in an excluded class like slaves. Well, even then, um, well, you have to understand, if, if, if you really look at the, even the slavery issue, um, it began really with Britain trying to make money, and if you stole an apple, they would basically say, okay, fine, you got five years, and they would sell you to a plantation in America. Yeah. All right, they put you in a, on, a, on a ship, send you over here, and that was your sentence. You didn't sit in a jail cell. Um, and that, it was basically, that's what the Constitution outlaws indentured servitude. All right. Um, but and you had Ben Franklin saying, "How would you like it if we we picked up all our rattlesnakes, put them in a bag, and sent them to you?" <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, so it was actually after the American Revolution that the Dutch started bring bringing the Africans over, uh, because Britain was still doing the same thing, you know, with its so so called criminals. But that's when Australia became the penal colony, right? Um, so the American wasn't taking the the criminals from Britain anymore, so they you know they shipped them off to Australia. But all this, even if you look at the the um, the interesting thing about slavery, is before 1855, congressmen um, they never got a salary. They got a, you know, they were paid on a per diem basis. That was it. 
and they only met for maybe a few weeks of the year. So in 1855, the whole issue over slavery began. And to get people to vote uh, in their favor against slavery in Kansas, etc., they promised annual salaries to the politicians. So the first annual salary starts in 1855. Has been downhill ever since. Absolutely. Once they're there, that's the problem. The, I mean, I've investigated many different types of governments, and uh, I would say the best one I ever encountered was uh, the city of Genoa. Uh, it it had uh, <clears throat> the rich, basically, were the rulers. But what it was was very interesting. Uh, they, the doge or like president would be appointed uh, and after that that family couldn't be the doge again all right for like about 25 years or so so they would never because they, it wasn't a permanent position they would be the doge for for up to two years and then have to return so they would never pass a law against themselves mm -hmm. and um, so everything was was more or less uh, legitimate at that time, and it's only with Marxism where you get into this oh rich versus poor stuff. Um, as long as Genoa basically was looking at it from a competitive standpoint against Venice and Florence, everybody benefited. It wasn't class warfare; it was warfare of Genoa against Florence. Yeah. Um, uh, and so everybody in the whole city benefited. Uh, but the whole, re the real key was that these, there were term limits. That was it. One time in and out, and you can't come back. And that family would not be, you know, would have to get in a queue again. And it'd be, uh, oh, look, you know, they say that uh, the United States Senate is the most uh, exclusive nursing home in the world, right? Oh, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, I knew Arlen Specter, who basically did the magic bullet theory on uh, Kennedy. Uh, he lived a few doors away from me when I was back in Jersey. And I just remember, you know, him talking about the Middle East. All these guys are dictators. They've been there for 35 years. And I turned to Arlen and I said, isn't that about as long as you've been in the Senate, too? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, I, you know, I was elected. I will. So were they, <laughs> you yeah. know. Just rigged elections, the same thing. But um, the whole key is um, once they're on that side of the table and they become our enemy, it's them always against us. The key is there has to be term limits, as I saw in Genoa. Then you're never going to pass a law that you yourself would be, it would be applied to you in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was much more responsible and was done basically, as I said, like uh, to benefit the city against another one. Uh, and that's what we have to return to. Uh, once you you have any kind of a career politician, I mean, and I've dealt with governments around the world, uh, and I don't see any difference. Because once they get in there, uh, it's always them against us all the time. Yeah, it's universal. Yeah, I mean, you take this central bank digital currency stuff. Um, why are they pushing it? Because I've been flat out right told, oh, well, we'll increase our taxation by at least 35%. Mm -hmm. Because whatever you pay in taxes, they figure you, there's another 25% you didn't tell them about. Yeah. Uh, and so th that's why they want to eliminate cash. Uh, if you and your wife go out to dinner and you hired the 16-year-old girl next door to watch the kids, um, then, <clears throat> oh my God, you paid her? She didn't pay any taxes? How much did you give her? Where's our 50%? I mean, this is what these people think about. This is what they come up dreaming up these ideas. All right. So um, we got one here. Uh, does Mr. Armstrong have any confidence in the Iraqi dinar? That's like uh, a scam running since the war, right? Yeah. Look, I mean, um, most of these things, uh, like you take the 
Ukraine, you take all of them. I mean, they're 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 just propped up regimes at this point. Uh, there's no real um, economy that's honest and trustworthy, which is really what is the backing behind a currency. Um, you take uh, the euro. I mean, when they were creating the euro, they even came to me. I sat down uh, with them, and they were putting out the propaganda that everybody would be paying the same interest rate. And I said, look, that's not going to happen unless you consolidate the debts. And I know, you know, uh, because I was negotiating with them. And, you know, Cole in in Germany um, knew if he allowed the German people to vote, they would have voted against it, joining the euro. So he put Germany in the euro. And what he did was he insisted there would be no consolidation of the debt because he felt that the Germans would go nuts if uh, you were basically absorbing the debt of Greece and Italy, etc. cetera. Um, so that's why they told me, uh, look, we just have to get the euro through and we'll worry about the consolidation of the debt later. And that was 1998. I mean, we're still waiting. <laughs> we're still waiting, exactly. Yeah. And that's why the euro, you know, was supposed to destabilize the dollar and all this other kind of nonsense. It can't happen because a fund manager, if he's going to invest in, in Europe, he still has to buy the debt of each individual country. And, um, and that's no different than, you know, looking at all the states in the U.S. Each one has a different credit rating. And that's why I said, look, the euro is not going to, this is not going to work. Um, you know, and, but they were selling it to people like, oh, it's going to, de- you know, dethrone the dollar. All that. You know, there is no net federal debt for, you know, you can't pick up the phone and say, yeah, buy me $10 billion worth of European debt. No. It can't happen. You got to go, okay, do I want Germany? Do I want Italy? What about France? What are they doing? Mm-hmm. You're, you're still back on the same issue as like the 50 states that we have. Correct. All right. So um, uh, how do you see the relationship between the U.S. dollar and the Swiss franc in the coming years? Is it just more of the same? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, um, Swiss is losing a lot of its... Um, foundation and what what made switzerland great um most people don't realize but i mean it when um when hitler came to power uh, what they did they passed a law that everybody had to have their um bank accounts offshore was illegal and it had to be in germany and that was because of the hyperinflation everybody moved money out of the country etc so um Effectively, what Swiss did, that's when they passed their Secrecy Act. Uh, it was a response to Hitler. And that's what made Switzerland Swiss. You know, during wars, they were neutral. That was a place that even, you know, heads of state could have put their money and not worry about. And now oh, look, at, look at it. It's oh, they put sanctions on on Russia. They confiscated private assets of Russians uh, because this was the agenda. You know, once they did that, they, uh, they lost their neutrality. They lost everything. Yeah. All right. Will the FDIC default on savings accounts, bank deposits, CDs, etc. When the default, when the U.S. defaults on its treasury notes? If yes, when? Where do you put your money for safekeeping? Uh, well, what you're really looking at is is uh, the this movement towards the CBDC, uh, and at that point, uh, that's when that's how you do kind of defaults to some degree. I would be concerned. Um, I mean, these people are kind of ruthless. And the worse it gets for them, the more draconian they will become. Uh, I wouldn't put it past them from even uh, making it so that, you know, just kind of, I think what Trudeau did in Canada was a, a trial balloon for them. When he, when he 
froze the accounts of anybody that donated to the truckers, not just the truckers, but anybody that even donated to them. And so effectively what you could do uh, and what they've been looking at is that uh, even Christine Lagarde said there will be controls on it. They could actually, you know, simply say, well, we don't like Trump and you can't donate any money to Trump. Um, you know, and they could do that by saying, uh, outlawing buying gold. Mm. Uh, and keep in mind that this is about power. They know the system is collapsing. And as because of that, they get more and more draconian. So, um, the, the problem with the debt, uh, default all right. Uh, you can see the stupidity like the the neocons. Uh, they're bashing China over Taiwan, etc. Okay. But uh, China was the largest holder of U.S. debt. They've been selling billions every month because <clears throat> they know if we're going to actually go to war, as some of these people are out here saying, um, you know, we'll be in war with China within five years. They cannot possibly hold any U.S. debt. You don't buy the debt of the guy that's that's, that's, that's trying blood to blood. shoot you. Yeah, you know? um, Crazy. That, that's why I mean that, that there's just no coherent strategy anymore. It's like each little group is just pursuing their own agenda. You got the the climate zealots out there who. <clears throat> Oh, we have to shut down all fossil fuels, heating, and now they're talking about cutting out, uh, oh, air conditioning causes it. Um, and um, I really think that they've now created another lab type uh, virus that's going after people's pets. There's a, a sudden <clears throat> massive mysterious virus that's killing dogs <laughs> and nobody knows where it came from. That's crazy. Uh, first time in history all right uh, wow. uh so it, it's and it's a respiratory thing the same similar to like COVID. um so i mean look there's nothing that these people um is is off the table um the, these climate people they have no idea you shut off fossil fuels <clears throat> all a right die off a mass die off yeah, and you don't want air conditioning. You don't want heating. You know, do you understand how civilization has even functioned? Um, I mean, you're looking at massive, massive civil unrest and civil wars over this kind of stuff. I mean, it, like I say, these people don't understand, I think, what they're really even saying. Uh, you go to some of these third world countries, if they have no gasoline or, or something like that, they can't even feed their families. Um, it, it is, and there's nobody that seems to be looking at any of this stuff. And you had just had John Kerry, uh, off in <clears throat> Dubai, uh, saying the air conditioning's a problem. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> you want to end all the oil, so that kills the Middle East there. And now you want to say they can't have air air conditioning. I mean, I've you know we have an office in UAE. It can be 90 degrees at, at midnight. Mm -hmm. It's hot. <clears throat> and now you don't want any air conditioning and you want to kid, you know, kill all energy. I mean, you know, hello, you think this is a Middle East war? Wait till you see what happens. <laughs> it's nuts. Uh, really crazy. All right. A couple more questions. I think we covered like uh, really a lot of territory here. Um, here now, this one's a little little confusing. But if gold was used as an absolute basis for currencies, why wouldn't it work? Once the price is established for gold, any time a government printed currency above its growth in GDP, the currency price would adjust downward. In theory, I guess. Well, that's exactly what happened with Brenton Woods. Um, <clears throat> they fixed gold at thirty five dollars, but they kept printing money. Uh, it was actually the Vietnam War that broke Bretton Woods. Yeah, um, guns and butter. The, the problem <clears throat> with anything, a gold standard or, or fixed exchange rate or whatever, 
uh, the economy is a business cycle. There are times that it goes up and there are times that it goes down. All right. And when you go down, the currency rises in purchasing power. They call it, you know, the, the flight to cash. All right. So, um, and then in a boom, you know, the assets are rising and the currency goes down. So you, you can't really fix anything because one, you'd have to eliminate the business cycle, which is what Marx was trying to do. And you just can't do that. It's impossible. It, it is because weather's in, involved in it. I mean, um, if there's a shortage, a drought, and wheat's going to go up in price, it can't be the same price all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to understand also a lot of these people that talk about going back to a gold standard, you have to change the entire political system. Yeah. How is the Democrat going to be able to run and say, well, vote for me and I'll, and I'll give you X, Y, and Z? He can't do that anymore. Who's going to, where, where's the uh, food stamp money going to come from? Uh, yeah, it's 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 a lot more complicated than simply gold, you know, a gold back currency. It's 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 never worked. It, it, they have always failed because there is a business cycle. Yeah. All right. And now, now that we have socialism with Marxism in there, they don't know how to run otherwise. All right. Last question here. Really appreciate your patience with these, but I thought some of them were quite good. Um so putting aside the fear mongers with their frequent dollar apocalypse and sometimes gold hype, at what date should we be holding a very minimal amount to no dollars and no U.S. treasuries? Well, I would be very concerned about the U.S. treasury side. Okay, stay short term. And I would say after, you know, after the elections, after 2024, uh, things are going to get a lot different. Um, I, it looks like we're heading towards war, and uh, my sources are, have been pretty, pretty damn good, really. Uh, these people are trying to create war before the election, and the neocons. This is their fifteen minutes in the sun. Mm -hmm. and that's why they hate Trump so much, because Trump started immediately firing John Bolton and uh, and all these people. Um, we didn't go to war when he was president. We had no new wars. That must have been a great disappointment to the military industrial complex. Yeah, well, you had John Bolton immediately, you know, when, um, I, I mean, I will say this. I I went to dinner at Mar-a-Lago uh, with Trump back in March of 2020 when he was still president. Oh. And, and I've met so many, you know, heads of state around the world. He was actually the first time he, any one of them ever really impressed me. He said that he wanted to pull the troops out of Afghanistan because he said he was sick and tired of writing letters to families that said, your son died for a godden country. And, um, and his, his words were, he says, what are we doing there? Uh, they've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? Now, uh, you had John Bolton immediately come out and like, oh, my God, you know, we can't leave Afghanistan. You know, these people want war all the time. If there were 10 Russians in, in, in Canada, he would advocate invading Canada. Uh, I, I don't know what it is with these people. I know some of them. And <clears throat> they're delusional. Normal. They look normal on the outside, but once they start talking, right? Well, they the theory they have is that uh, they talk themselves into like, oh, Saddam Hussein was a dictator and Assad and Gaddafi, and you you go into the um, if we go in and we overthrow these people, they think they're going to get a, a ticker tape parade, and the people will cheer for being you know uh, freed. They're, they think this of Russia, that the Russians will cheer you know, if we mm -hmm. take out Putin. I, you know, you're, they're just complete nuts. Um, yeah. And, you know, you had John McCain there at Maidan in Ukraine. Yes, overthrow your government. America is behind you. We'll support you. Can you imagine 
if Putin came to Washington and did the same thing, oh, with bro, Biden, you know, will support you. I mean, that would be so outrageous. Um, nuts. It, it is. It, it, it's just Absolutely. completely nuts. So, I mean, after 24, I would be very concerned about government debt. The dollar is probably still going to remain king up until maybe 27, 28. Um, because as war happens, the capital concentrates here. But that's also why you see real estate still going crazy in Florida, is still going up. Uh, besides, you have the migration from the blue states to the red states. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, I mean, we have offices around the world. Everybody knows about Florida. <laughs> and um, uh, basically, you know, you're looking at a lot of, of capital still coming in. I spoke to, uh, you know, realtors that I know locally, and they say houses that are one to five million dollars, people are just paying cash. Snapping them up. Yeah, there's no mortgage rates. They don't care about that. Um, yeah, go ahead, raise the interest rates. They're, they're trying to get money off the grid. Mm -hmm. That's really what the issue is. So you see... Gold has been rising. Stock market was rising with it. That's where I've been telling people you don't understand. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, since 2011, since we started talking. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if these people just ever looked at charts historically or what, but um, I mean, he, he, we put out a chart on our, our site, you know, with the interest rates in the stock market during Trump's years. You know, when you know as Trump was there, the stock market was booming. They called it the Trump rally. But the Fed was raising interest rates the whole time. They didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's You have to look at this thing, you know, uh, objectively and stop with all the myths and, and nonsense. Um, but, you know, as I've said before, you know, the U.S. government was bankrupt in 1896. J.P. Morgan had to lend $100 million in gold to bail it out. By World War One, U.S. was already the financial capital of the world. By World War Two, we ended up with seventy-six percent of the world gold reserves. Why? It was World War One and Two that sent all the money here. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got tanks going down the street, blowing up banks, you're not going to leave your money there. Capital oh. was flight. It was the same thing that I, I said that about Switzerland. Because of the hyperinflation, people moved their money out of Germany and were you know, parking money everywhere else, you know, and that's why Hitler came in and said it's against the law to have an account outside the country. Right. It was the f capital flight because of the hyperinflation. Gotcha. All right. Well, that is it. Really appreciate you spending this time with us, Martin, and uh, answering these questions. Remember, Martin's site is armstrongeconomics.com. Make sure you go to his site, sign up for his uh, his regular missives they come out regularly and uh, we read them all the time and uh, sign up for his private uh, blog as well very uh, reasonable fee 15 bucks a month totally worth it hey got any questions uh any more questions shoot them off to kl at kerrylutz.com and uh, well that's it martin always a pleasure thank you so much well, thank you. It's great to see you. See you again next time. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.